Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And we are a hands-on training center for dentists of all experience levels in an effort to improve your skills and knowledge. Today we're going to discuss part four of this ceramic series. This will be on the impression and temporary. One of the pieces of equipment that I really like are these Castro Viejo scissors and these are uh, made by a company here in the United States. You can get these all over the place. Castro Viejo was uh, a famous ophthalmologist that developed a series of these instruments of different shapes and uses. Another instrument that I really like is a serrated cord packer, which has these little notches around the end. You can also have a tissue pressure cap, and these are great when you're doing a full crown, but not so good for inlays and onlays and cords. Uh, lasers are great, but I like cords the best, actually. A zero, a one, a two, and these even come in a size three. And please note that these are braided cords, not knitted cords. And if we're going to be using these for an inlay or an onlay, I like to cut them in half so that they're not quite as long, and we can use them in the interproximal area. So we're going to go ahead and prepare the cords for just this particular case. And I'm going to use a zero cord followed by a size 2. It's usually a small cord followed by a larger cord. And we're going to cut the septal areas of the rubber dam, making sure that these Castro Viejo scissors, the tips are visible before we push, because we want to make sure we don't inadvertently hit some tissue. Fold the rubber dam out of the way, and then go ahead and take your cord and soak that in a hemostatic agent. I happen to like a 25% solution of aluminum chloride, which you can either purchase from a company or have it made by a compounding pharmacy. So we're gonna go ahead and soak all these pieces of cord, and then we're just gonna squeeze them dry just a little bit before we're ready to place them. So I'm gonna go ahead and place three cords of size zero in each of the box areas. And I like to start on the line angle area and then take the serrated cord instrument and push it back from where I just came from to help to cinch it into position rather than pulling away and having the cord come up out of the tissue where we anchored it. And this works really well by pulling this cord or pushing it away from where you just started placing it. And we're going to repeat the process for the distal box on the MOD and the mesial box on the MOD. And this is all being done with the zero cord. Would a laser be effective here? Sure. Or could you use electrosurgery? Absolutely. Uh, my personal favorite when I have the space is cord. When we have redundant tissue, I think electrosurgery or lasers are very effective. And I use both of those modalities in my private practice when they are indicated. And so that's the second cord. And then you're going to basically see that you want to go back and make sure that you've pushed the previous cord that you placed down a little bit, make sure it gets into the sulcus. And now the final cord. And we're doing this with the rubber dam in place. And the reason for this is that the patient has not yet gained control of the procedure. You're still in charge. You have the area isolated. The patient won't be talking or rubbing their tongue against their teeth. And you'll be able to maintain really good moisture control at this point. Not only that, the patient won't taste some of the medicaments. Aluminum chloride is a, a very bitter tasting uh, solution, and it's nice not to have the patient taste that product. So now the number two cord is being placed, and if the sulcus is so narrow that the number two cord can't fit, a number one cord would suffice. On the other hand, if the sulcus is wide, we can go to a number three cord. Oftentimes, the second cord in this particular procedure will not fall all the way down to the sulcular area. It will rest up above a little bit, and that's perfectly acceptable. The key is to get that first cord into the sulcus and held down so that when you pull the top cord out at the time of impression taking, you're not going to have a collapse of the tissue back over the finish line area. Now, obviously, if these were super gingival finish lines, we wouldn't need any cord at all unless there was some tissue seepage, in which case the cords could be beneficial in stopping that. Then, of course, there are other things we can use as adjuncts, like these kaolin-containing astringent 
type products like Expacil or Traxident, and they can be placed on top of the cords to further dry up the tissue. Now that you have the six cords placed, we can go to another technique if we need to called a backup. And a backup is simply a little cotton pellet that you've soaked in some of the aluminum chloride solution, you've uh, squeezed out the excess, and then you can insert this in the interproximal areas. And this will help to push the tissue down a little bit further and to soak up any tissue fluid. It tends to work really well in cases where you have very angry tissue. It's also uh, sort of analogous to the compra cap type uh, pressure cap that I showed you earlier for full crowns. This would be for inlays and onlays. Now that we've got the tissues retracted, let's remove the rubber dam and have the patient bite down on a 2x2 two two while we wait about five minutes or so before we're ready to take the impression. So let's take a look at the impression technique that we're going to be utilizing. I like this little Mojo syringe by Ho Dental. They're a company out of Las Vegas and they've improved this syringe over the years and this is their latest version. The little tip here rotates 360 degrees. It's very small and then uh, it has a, a chamber that you fill up to this little V shape there with your light body material and then when you're ready to activate it you twist this little knob here that releases the material from the double barrel portion and allows it to go into the mixing chamber. Let's make sure that we bleed the impression material and I'm using a light viscosity material and putting the syringe up against the the end of the cartridge and then pushing slowly and carefully to that little v-shape and then breaking it away quickly now I can go ahead and add the little plunger to the back end and push it in gently until the material goes to the top of the double barrels. We're now ready to go. This little emery tray, unfortunately these are not being made anymore, but you can still get them on eBay and other locations. They are uh, fantastic because they're a very high grade steel and they don't distort. Uh, and you can take this little piece of like coffee filter paper and trim it so that it fits more easily between the little slots on this. And then you want to secure this with wax or uh, in my case I used a clear PVS bite registration material just to secure this in position. And this is great because it will fit in almost anyone's mouth and you can bend it to adjust it if necessary and of course you can use it over and over again. So now we're ready to go. We've had the patient sitting for about five minutes. We're going to remove the backups. At this point we're going to rinse with water. We want to thoroughly rinse all the medicaments away and allow the cords to be wet so when we pull them out they don't tear the tissue. Very important to have wet cords at this point. Now what we're going to want to do is make sure that the zero cord is still in position. So if in any situations you see that cord sticking up like it is right here, go ahead and push it down a little bit further so that it's firmly within the sulcus and it's apical to the finish line. Very critical. Now we're going to dry. It's got to be thoroughly dry for the impression material to capture all of the details of these preparations. So let's make sure we dry that very thoroughly. We're now going to go ahead and load the tray with either a medium viscosity or in my case I like to use a heavy body. I just believe that the heavy body being a more filled polyvinyl siloxane product is going to be more rigid and more accurate. These double bite impression trays have been shown time and time again to have a superior accuracy to taking a full arch impression and trying to mount that. So even though I'm very much clusally oriented in my practice, very much a prosthodontic type practice with mounting models and face bows, etc. for major cases, in inlays and single units, I think the double bite tray is really the king in terms of capturing the dynamic occlusal relationships better than any other system. Now we're going to activate the mojo with a twist and we're going to go ahead and start injecting into the sulcular areas first and then we're going to then move that into the occlusal area and massage the tip into all the line angles, all the point angles, so that we don't capture any bubbles. We'll get the other mesial box and then notice how the tip of the impression syringe does not leave the product at any time. It always stays within the product so as not to create any bubbles in this area. 
So we're just keeping it in the product and we're going to cover the teeth completely. Not just the margins, but go way beyond the margins so that we can have this flooding of both preparations. This is really critical to capture details along the cable surface areas beyond the margins. And then if you have a little extra material, go ahead and place it on the opposing arch so that you can capture more details there. We insert the tray on the preparations and then have the patient bite. We don't try to push it in the mouth and have the patient bite simultaneously, but we insert on the preps, then have them bite, and we're gonna secure the patient's chin with our palm or have the patient do it themselves for about five minutes. When we pull the impression out, we want to inspect the impression for details and make sure that we have no voids in the finish lines or the internal features for that matter. There's really no reason why you can't capture all the details of this impression in your very first attempt if you pay attention to the details and the technique that I've just described. The little pieces of cord you see there that are incorporated into the impression, they could be pulled out. It's, it's really up to you. You can talk to your technician whether they would prefer you to pull them out or they do it. In this particular case, they're not even close to the finish line, so I'm not that concerned about it. But you can see the finish lines and the area beyond the finish line has uh, been captured. This temporary technique is one that was taught to me by Dr. Richard Tucker, and it's called Duraseal. And we can dip the uh, bender brush in the, the monomer and then the powder, and then re-dip it into the monomer, like in a wicking motion, just to pull up some of the monomer. And then we can apply this onto the preparation. And you can go back and forth and just apply it this way. This is the Vaseline that we want to place on the preparations because IDS is going to leave these surfaces very much wanting to bond to whatever temporary material you put on here. So we're going to place a little bit of that separator there. We're going to place some dental stopping now in the box areas to prevent this Duraseal product that I showed earlier from getting into the tissue. It's a little bit aggravating to the tissue, so putting a little bit of dental stopping, which is just gutta percha, up against the tissue, and then flowing the material over this provides for a really nice temporary. It's not very sophisticated, but it's incredibly practical, and it holds these teeth in position really nicely, occlusally and proximally. So when we go to deliver the restorations, things are going to be as they were when we took the impression. So we're just going to go ahead and paint this product using this liquid powder technique over the surfaces of these uh, preparations. Don't worry, they won't be sensitive because the IDS is going to keep the dentin well sealed. And because we've used the uh, Vaseline product on top of the IDS surface, this material will not stick. And trust me, if you don't use a thin layer of Vaseline, you're in deep trouble. Your provisionals are going to be bonded to the teeth as though they were permanent restorations and at delivery you're going to have a miserable time removing them. We're going to discuss the modifications required at delivery to reactivate that surface for bonding, but for now, let's just place it temporary. Have the patient bite down and form it like this, and they won't be able to floss, but you'll be amazed at how healthy the tissue will remain after a short period of time. In our next section, we're going to talk about cementation. I'm going to be sending this to my laboratory, and they're going to do two Emacs restorations, and we'll be able to pick up the discussion at that time. I want to thank you for your attention. Have a good one.